<laughs> Jesus was baptized in water. And in Mark's account, it emphasizes something that's really important for us to catch. He says, when Jesus was baptized in water, the heavens opened, the Father spoke, and he said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. We pray a prayer often, and it's a good prayer. We pray for open heavens. We pray for God to tear the heavens open, the Isaiah 64 passage where we pray for the Lord to rip open the heavens and come down because we're so desperate and hungry for more. It's an important prayer because we're praying for the heavens to open over cities and nations. But sometimes we live in ignorance of what we already possess. When you pray for what you already have, you never have the joy of seeing it answered because you're not aware that you already have the answer. Prayer is designed to be one of the priority categories or realms, if you will. Obtaining answers, getting breakthroughs is supposed to be the ongoing source of joy for the believer. Jesus said, in that day you will ask the Father in my name and he will do whatever you ask that your joy may be full. Now listen carefully. If we do not get our joy from breakthroughs, kingdom breakthroughs, then we have to get our joy from the discipline of prayer. And when our joy comes from the discipline of, of prayer, then we begin to celebrate form rather than breakthrough, form rather than substance. It's the beginning of the formation of religion, religion being form without power. And it starts by becoming a people that have to, have to derive our satisfaction with the fact that we put in X amount of hours, we did this many fasts, we did all these kinds of things, therefore we are devoted to the Lord. And when Jesus designed this thing, he said, you'll ask the Father in my name. He's going to do whatever you ask, but he's going to do it, that your joy may be full. Now, joy is such a priceless heavenly commodity. We do not have, I don't know that we've begun to understand the, uh, the measure, the value of joy in heaven. It is such a priceless commodity in heaven that the Father reserved that as the reward for Jesus in enduring the cross. It says, and he endured the cross because of the joy set before him. Joy was the reward for the suffering. It was what the Father gave him to honor him for his obedience. Joy is that valuable. And the scripture says that your breakthrough in prayer is supposed to be that resource that brings continuous ongoing fullness of joy. Our problem is that we continue to pray for what we possess. And if I pray for what I possess, but I live in ignorance of what I possess, then I never have the experience of the breakthrough that brings exhilaration and joy. Does this make any sense? Does make, all right. it, it's a big deal because we pray for many things. How many times have we prayed, Lord, be with us today? He said, I'll never forsake you. I'll never leave you. It's not a prayer he can answer. And what we do is we actually pray things that war against what he has promised. It's not okay. It's not okay. Because we fill our heart and mind with things that actually war with what God has declared. When he says, I will never forsake you, let there never be words that come out of my mouth that contradict that. And especially words that we put in the category of prayer. When he, you guys doing all right? You, you're gonna have to just smile now and then or you'll scare me, all right? And I'm, I'm gonna be as nice as I can be tonight and have a lot of fun with you, but I, I wanna throw a few punches first, all right? All right. When he said, Jesus was baptized in water and the heavens parted, the original language there is that the Father tore open the heavens. He tore open the heavens and the Spirit came down. What was the prayer of Isaiah 64? Rend the heavens and come down. What happened at Jesus' baptism? The heavens were torn, the Spirit of God was released, and an open heaven was created. For most Christians, closed heavens are between the ears. 
They exist in the thought life that literally empowered darkness to do exactly what the believer has believed. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. Amen? The Spirit of God lives in us. The scripture says the Father is jealous for the Spirit in us. He is the one who tore the heavens open. What demonic power can block the fellowship of the Spirit of God in you and the Father in heaven? There is no power that can separate. There isn't any demonic power, any realm that is significant and powerful enough to prohibit or to block that fellowship. Therefore, you live under an open heaven. Now, what do we want? We want it over our cities, of course. But it's faithfulness in these realms, these realms of obedience and in prayer so that as I live in, under an open heaven, I learn through uh, demonstrations of faith, through walking in realms of authority, then that openness of uh, open heaven over me continues to expand until when I walk into a room, when you walk into a room, the entire atmosphere changes. Now, what I'm not trying to do is to create, you know, some class of believer that just becomes uh, very self-focused that people would think that we're men and women of God. You understand that it's not about that at all. What it is, is the Spirit of God lives in every believer, but He does not rest upon every believer. The scripture says in, in the Gospel of John concerning this baptism of Jesus that when he came up out of the water, the Spirit of God came upon him in the form of a dove and remained. It's a significant statement because doves are very nervous. They're extremely sensitive birds. They take flight at the slightest uh, surprise. If I have a dove sitting on my shoulder in the natural and I don't want him to fly away, how am I going to walk down these stairs? Every step is going to be with a dove in mind. The goal for the believer he is in me eternally. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you, but he does not rest upon all of us always. And the goal for the believer should be that we would learn how to host the presence of God, that his presence might rest upon us and alter the environment of every place that we go. It is possible to give place to the Spirit of God to rest upon us and remain so that as we go places, things shift and change simply because you stepped into the room. I've experimented with this for years, and I'm telling you, what you become conscious of, you, have, you are positioned to manifest. What you become aware of, you are positioned to release. The ministry of the gospel is not merely a, mess, a ministry of words. It is a ministry of releasing presence into the earth. <clears throat> Jesus is walking down the road. People are pressing in. They're asking questions. They're extremely impressed with what they just saw him do. The crowds are there. There's excitement. And he stops. He says, who touched me? And he turns around and he looks and he sees a woman who's been sick forever, spent all her money trying to get well, it didn't work. And all she did was touch the edge of his clothing. Now the anointing, the presence of the Spirit of God is substance. It's not a theory. It's not a doctrine. It is the substance of God's person rested upon Jesus so dramatically that when she touched the edge of his garment, she was able to make a demand, put a withdrawal on what he carried. Now picture this. What is it like to live with such a consciousness of presence upon you that you know when someone else has made a demand? Now remember this. 
the Spirit of God was given to Jesus without measure. So we're not talking about somebody taking it all and now I'm exhausted because I have nothing left. It's not that. It's that he has such an awareness of the Spirit upon him because that Holy Spirit is who communicates what the Father is doing, who empowers his words, his actions. It is the Holy Spirit that is the connection, if you will, between him and the Father. We know he only does what he sees his Father do. We know he only says what he uh, says what he hears his Father say. So he's walking down the road, somebody touches his garment, he's aware of a release of power, and he stops. They said, who touched me? And he sees the woman, and she's, of course, is very healed, uh, completely healed. Peter and James are, walk, James are walking to the temple, and they see a man who's lame from birth. And Peter says, I don't have any money, but I will give you what I have. This is such a profound statement because he didn't say, I'm going to pray for you. He said, I'm going to give to you something that I possess. When we live in ignorance of what we possess, we fail to write the checks that are equal to the bank account that God has given us. We write such small checks of risk, if I can use checks as a metaphor, we write such small checks in ministry. You understand, I'm not talking about money here. We take such small risks because we live with such ignorance of what we already possess. I pray that in, uh, as a result of these days that we've had together with, uh, in this conference, is that the ongoing revelation of God would rest upon us as a people to discover what He has already imparted to us so that we can uh, reasonably pursue the increase in what we're lacking and what we're missing. Instead of praying for what we already possess, where we just, let's be honest, when you pray for what you possess, prayer becomes boring. We become very fatigued in prayer and bored in prayer because we fail to get the breakthrough and the real issue is that we live in ignorance what has already been deposited into our lives. So here Peter walks and he grabs the man's hand. He says, what I have, I'm going to give you. Now, rise in the name of Jesus. What happened to him? Jesus said, the kingdom is within you. Now that kingdom is released in many different ways. It is released through touch. It is released through prophetic act. It is released through word. In John chapter 6, Jesus said, my words to you are spirit and they are life. Whenever Jesus spoke, he spoke what the Father was saying. So nothing originated. I, I remind you, Jesus so limited himself that he couldn't do any miracles. He couldn't, you know, he couldn't wow anybody. He had, he had emptied every, he put everything aside so that he'd have to get it from the Father to have impact. And so he was that dependent. And so here he is, everything he has to get, he has to get now from the Father as a human being that has nothing to give because he wanted to model what life could be like for every person in this room, any person who is forgiven of sin and is empowered by the Spirit of God. And so Jesus makes this declaration. It's a profound lesson in John 6. My words to you are spirit and they are life. Jesus is the Word of God made flesh, but every time he spoke, the Word of God became spirit. Word made flesh, Word made Spirit. Why is that important? Romans says, Paul said this in Romans, he said, the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink, it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is in the Holy Spirit. When words become spirit, the realms of God's dominion are released over humanity. When we say what the Father is saying, then we literally impart presence through speech. It is not the volume. It is not the profundity. It is the source. 
wasn't from the heart of the Father. If we tap the heart of the Father and we speak, then something is released, and it is the person of the Holy Spirit who himself contains the realm of the kingdom, king's domain. The realm of God's dominion is contained in the realm of the Spirit. When we say what the Father is saying, we change the options of every hearer. When Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he was letting them know, when I talk to you, a reality is released over you that changed your options. And your answer is within reach. It's at hand. So here's Jesus who's touched, his garment is touched, power leaves him and changes a woman's health. Peter realized what he carried, what I have... I give you in the name of Jesus. This became such a significant part of the early church's life that the community took note of where these believers would go. Stories passed around the community that said, just bring the sick out along the road when Peter goes to pray and just get him close enough so his shadow will touch him. Now shadows have no substance. What we're talking about is get the sick close enough physically to his person so that when he walks by, his shadow will touch them and that person will be healed, that person will be delivered. It's amazing that the community actually became aware they didn't get it through teaching, they didn't get it through doctrine, they didn't get it through anything except observation that when the man of God walked down the road, he changed his environment. It was so powerful that they finally said, just get the sick, bring him into the road, lay him down close to where Peter's going to walk because he's going over there to pray and he's over here right now. So get the sick between him and there. Shadows have no substance. What's the point? Your shadow will always release whatever overshadows you. What do you host? What, is your, what are your affections anchored into? What are you conscious of? What do you live conscious of? We know instinctively without anybody teaching us that a, a depressed Christian will not walk into a room and see their shadow heal people. Why? Because we know instinctively anyone who's depressed for whatever, whatever's going on, They are turned inward. And when we are turned inward, while we have the capacity to release presence, we have in fact become a dead sea. The dead sea is a place where water flows in, but nothing goes out. And for that reason, everything in the sea is dead. And as believers, this happens to us. When we get wrapped up in fear, when we get wrapped up in anxiety, when we become discouraged, depressed, and we allow that thing to be prolonged in our life, we don't take biblical matters. We, we don't take things according to what Scripture says and, and apply the biblical solutions to these issues. What happens is we become very self-absorbed. You may even be one that criticizes yourself and and, and efforts to be humble, but listen, it's still self-centered. I used to pray for hours and hours and hours and hours, but it was all about me. It was about me. I was confessing, oh God, how rotten I was. And I was doing all this stuff that looked really good on the outside. And it might have been really good in a book somewhere. But there wasn't liberty in a relationship because I was preoccupied by what I wasn't instead of being preoccupied by who he is. There is a shift, and that kind of self-centeredness is no more legal than walking around saying, we're the greatest thing on the planet, we're the greatest thing since sliced bread. That kind of arrogance is easy to spot, but the other kind sneaks into church daily. Because it, it exhibits false humility, and false humility will never take you to your destiny. True humility will. And so we have these stories in Scripture where people would simply touch. Paul is working. He's building tents, and they learn. There's such a presence of God on this man that somebody just get the apron that he worked in. Grab that piece of cloth. Take it over to Aunt Martha. She's tormented with demons. Put it on her back and watch what happens. And they would. They would take the cloth from his body. They would take the stuff that he worked in. 
But the presence that abided on him wasn't just in him for his eternal security. Wasn't just in him to give him comfort in life. It was upon him to alter and to change the environment around him. Paul said this. He says, you are restricted by your affections. What does that mean? When I am self-centered, when I'm worried about myself, I'm fearful, I'm anxious, I'm whatever it might be. When I'm turned inward, I have restricted the flow of the anointing from me. Why? Because the anointing flows through godly affection. Watch how the Spirit of God moves in any setting. You watch in any meeting. Just watch. You just watch. I'll look around the room, and there are times where, let's just say we were going to minister prophetically to someone. What I would do is I would just start talking to you until my heart started to get pulled by an individual. Why? Because affection. I'm talking about godly affection now. I'm not talking about human natural appearance. I'm not talking about the person who wears the t-shirt that says, pick me, pick me. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about... The godly affection where you're drawn to an individual. It's unexplainable, but don't stop and think about it. Act, because that is where the anointing is going to be released. Paul says you're restricted by your affections. So what happens when I get wrapped up with fear and anxiety? That which is supposed to flow from me, that river of divine presence that is supposed to alter the geography around me, is now constrained and restricted to be... to to, um, just to satisfy my own life. And what happens, as I've already stated, is it becomes the Dead Sea. Jesus healed and touched and delivered so many people in three and a half years that the earth couldn't attain a full record. Now, that's, not, that's incomprehensible to us. The impact was so significant that if every detail was recorded, we couldn't record them all. Now, that is the Holy Spirit unquenched in one man in three and a half years. It is that presence resting on one person for three and a half years. So significant that when Peter learned this from him and began to host the presence himself and learn how to have that spirit, that dove rest upon him and remain without compromise, without the kinds of things that drive away, not the presence in the sense that God withdraws from us and the covenant is broken. I, I hope you understand. I don't, I don't mean that. The spirit of God is in us. He made a covenant. He'll never lead us, leave us. But there is a presence, a spirit of, the spirit of God that rests upon us that is there according to the assignment we have, the yieldedness that we have to what God's purposes are in the earth. And we see this kind of a model for us in Paul that can build tents so powerfully that even his manual labor, there was an anointing on him where they could take his clothing to the diseased and tormented and they could be set free. Profound. That Peter could merely walk from his house to the temple and people would be healed on the way and there wasn't any stopping to lay hands. It was the presence that rested upon him. Now, I don't know what you guys do with this, but this just makes me jealous. It just makes me, this makes me ache inside for what is possible. Now, you know that Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do. So when he models something that is head and shoulders above anything I've ever experienced, and then he, he, he doesn't stop there. He says, by the way, you're going to go past what I did. Then, you know, you either don't believe it or you just get crazy with hunger. You just kind of get stupid with hunger and say, oh God, just do whatever it takes and please just rest upon me. Work on me. Work, do something in me so that I can actually impart presence. Matthew chapter 10. We're going to read a very, very familiar portion of scripture, um, one that I've actually done here at least once, probably a bunch of times. 
but I want us to do it again. Is everybody okay? Yes. You happy? All right. Me too. There is such a dramatic shift in how life is lived from Old Testament to New. And I, I really feel like the shift that is going on in your lives, what's going on in mine, in our city, is an indicator of a shift in seasons that is so dramatic that it could impact entire nations, certainly entire cities. I don't say that carelessly. I don't say that as a raw, 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 raw cheerleading exercise. Um, I'm saying it because it is the assignment. When the Lord gave us the assignment to disciple nations, he then gave us an inheritance that included everything that exists. Why would God give us an inheritance that is beyond comprehension? Because we need it to complete the assignment that is beyond imagination. The assignment is to disciple nations. The assignment is not get a token representation out of every tribe and tongue. The assignment is become the nation that disciples nations. A person can disciple a person. A family can disciple a family. But it's a nation that disciples a nation. Matthew chapter 10, there's a commission, one of the commissions that Jesus gave his disciples. Verse 7, he says, as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Look at verse 8 again. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Now it's amazing to me. I'm really uh, thankful for what's going on here. I, I grow in, in absolute affection and admiration for Paul and Denise and their whole team here. Every time I come, it just explodes and increases. And this is such a Holy Spirit-friendly place. And I'm so thankful for the school that you guys have and what you guys are doing, training people to do. I really am. I mean, I just, I can't tell you how thrilled I am. And I'm thankful that this verse is literally being practiced and trained and taught here. But... Do you realize that in most institutions where you are trained for Christian ministry, you can go there four years, eight years, 12 years, and never find one class that tells you how to get somebody free from demons or get healed in their body? Now, I'm not saying that the other stuff we learn in these schools are wrong. I'm not saying the leadership classes, the music classes, the, you know, the administrative stuff. I'm not saying that stuff is wrong. They're, they're, they're very useful. They're just secondary. They can't trump the assignment God gave. They can't take the place of what he said to do. You know, people come to me. They say, Bill, I, say, I want you to pray for me. I say, well, sure. What do you want me to pray for? So I just need to go know God's will for my life. I said, well, that, that was easy. It's, it's a heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and cleanse lepers. And they look, you know, well, what I meant was, you know, should I be a school teacher or a missionary? Or I'll just pick one. Then heal the sick, raise the dead, <laughs> cast out devils, and cleanse lepers. Well, what I really meant was, I don't know if I should be married or single. I go, well, what do you want to be? Well, I want to be married. I said, then get married, then heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and cleanse lepers. You, you can't, you know, you can't do everything else but what he said to do and feel good about life. Well, I've tried it and it didn't work. Then get back into the secret place and find out why it didn't work. The problem is never on his end of the equation. It doesn't mean we walk in guilt and shame. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means get in the secret place. Get alone with God. Cry out. He said, well, I've done that. Do it some more. All I know to do is say, get in the quiet place, cry out to God, get in the public place, take risk. That's it. It's that combination. You get out, you try it, it doesn't work, get back before God, say, oh God. I had a situation a couple of years ago where I'd, I, I was uh, in Texas for a couple of nights, and in those two nights, I had five people come to me with MS. And I spent hours praying for all five of them after the meetings. Not one of them was healed. 
Now, you can come to a number of different conclusions. You can go, well, obviously, Bill, you were shooting blanks uh, that night, those two nights, and yeah, that's, that's one certain conclusion. Another one could be, well, the next time somebody with MS comes to me, I'll just have to send them to somebody who really has the anointing for MS, because apparently I don't have it. Or you could say, God loves me enough to summon me into the secret place by feeling the pain of people that didn't get free. And either I can use that pain to propel me into the secret place to get what has been made available, or I can pass it off, create some stupid doctrine that causes somebody else to have a chance to minister healing when God gave me the opportunity. He summoned me. He summoned me. Most of what you need in life will be brought to you. But most of what you want, you'll have to go get. Your survival is insured. It's guaranteed. But for you to come into your destiny, that one will not be brought to you on a silver platter. There is a fight that must be gone through, one of persistence, one of diligence, one of knowing how to face loss, knowing how to bring strength and courage to ourselves in the middle of confusion. Those things are so essential in building us as people that can actually contain and continue to hold on to the very answer once we get it. We have prayed into a lifestyle. Most of us fast and pray to get a breakthrough for a problem. Jesus fasted and prayed into a lifestyle so that when another problem came up, he was prepared to deal with it. He went after a lifestyle so that when something came out of uh, unexpected, he was ready to deal with it. The Lord has called us like a David who kills the lion and the bear when no one is watching. It's the secret place ministry. It's where, it's where things are obtained. It's laying on our face before God when nobody knows. It's getting up in the middle of the night when you're already exhausted, but you just go out and you lay before God. And you say, God, I can't live if you don't do this in me. I just can't live. You are the one that put this passion in me. You put a dream in me to see this disease healed, to see this torment broken off of people's lives. And I cannot live with the, with the theory and not seeing it demonstrated. It's those kinds of nights where the lion and the bear get killed. And once you kill the lion and the bear in private, God will trust you with killing Goliath in public. This passage is so profound because he gives the assignment. It's very simple. Go heal the sick. It's funny to me. He didn't say pray for the sick. He said heal the sick. I've been saying for the last six or eight months, I'm so glad the church is finally learning to pray for the sick. Pretty soon we'll learn how to heal the sick. People say, well, Bill, we don't heal people. God does. I go, I know, I know. I, I just wish he would have said that. It's a bummer when God's theology is different than ours. And I do believe he's the one who heals the sick. But he gives the command because somewhere in there, your will is what releases his will. See, faith does not come by determination. Faith comes by surrender. It does not come from exercising extraordinary will. You don't choose faith. You choose to rest in God. Faith comes out of rest. It does not come out of energy. It does not come out of effort. There's something about striving that actually creates the duplication of faith, the counterfeit presumption. But there's something about rest that puts us in a place where faith becomes the normal expression of the believer. So in this passage, he says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, cleanse lepers. And then the last phrase is really significant. Freely you have received, freely give. Remember when Peter said, such as I have, I 
give to you? Jesus already described the kingdom is within you. The revelation right now for us is, we must press into this. God, you've got to show us the unlimited resource of divine presence that exists within us that we are privileged to now give away. It's my conviction that all ministry can be summed up, uh, can, can be boiled down to one thing. All ministry is actually imparting the person of the Spirit of Christ into the atmosphere, into a situation. It's actually imparting a person. Freely you have received, freely give. What have you received? Him. I want you to jump down to verse uh, 12. It says, when you go into a household, greet it. And if the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. If it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. Now, I don't know. You guys maybe hear this taught on a lot. Uh, I, I don't think I ever have in my life, except when I've tried. It's just a weird verse. <laughs> you know, let's be honest. This is kind of like one of those, you just read over it, you know. And I'm sure it meant something to them. <laughs> Bless their hearts. <laughs> when you go into a house, let your peace, you know, what do you do? Do you walk through the door and go, shalom? You know, what is it that you do? Do you, you know, do you write peace on the wall? What, what is it that you do? Part of what needs to happen is we have to understand Peace is the actual atmosphere of heaven. It is the substance. It is the air of heaven. It's the oxygen of heaven. It is substance. It comes in the form of a person. Because in this world, peace is always the absence of noise. It's the absence of conflict. It's the absence of war. In this world, peace is the absence of something. In his world, peace is the presence of someone. So when he says, let your peace rest upon the house, he's literally instructing us to release the presence of God. Now remember, he is in you. Now how did Jesus release the presence? He said, my words are spirit and they are life. Tapping into what the Father is saying in a specific situation and making that declaration is what changes the atmosphere and it releases presence into the atmosphere. It changes the options of every hearer. Now, peace, what is the symbol of peace? The international symbol of peace is the dove with what in its mouth? Olive branch in its mouth. Interesting, isn't it? that the symbol of peace, international symbol of peace, would be the dove that has been released upon you to remain. And then Jesus gives you an assignment. Wherever you go, even if you're on a ministry trip and you're taken into a home of people you don't know, let your peace rest on the house. Now, if nobody's there who wants it, take it back. It's interesting. Jesus always made too much food, but he made sure they picked up the leftovers. He was always extravagant, but he was never wasteful. And so now he says, release presence. And if that presence is not appreciated by those who are there, take it back and leave. Now that's supposed to be practical instruction. Learning how to cooperate with the Holy Spirit is the absolute heart and soul of all ministry. Everything else that is done apart from our cooperation with the Holy Spirit is vain effort. It is the Spirit of God that takes the simple things we do and He makes them supernaturally effective. Listen to this passage. It came to pass at the end of 40 days... Noah opened the window of the ark which he made and he sent out a raven which kept going to and fro till the waters had dried up from the earth. He also sent out from himself a dove. The language here is amazing. He sent out from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place 
for the sole of her foot, and she returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand, and he took her and drew her into the ark to himself. He waited yet another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. And the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return to him any more. That is the prophetic picture of what Jesus taught in Matthew 10. Here's the deal. The Spirit of God changes everything. Everything. Now listen carefully. The Old Testament, you touch the leper, you become unclean. The Old Testament, somebody spits on an offering that you're about to give, it's now no good. It's an unclean offering. Because the entire revelation was the presence of sin contaminates whatever it touches. Jesus comes along, he touches the leper, the leper becomes clean. The power of righteousness is so effective in the New Testament that Paul says, listen, if there's a believing spouse in a household, she or he will sanctify every other member in the household. Righteousness is so contagious that it creates an umbrella of safety around anyone who comes under that environment. Everything has shifted from watch out from being contaminated to be careful of your assignment and make sure that you host this presence because you've been positioned to release him into the atmosphere that he might find places to rest. He's always looking for the resting place. And if he finds none, and this happens in ministry a lot, you'll go into a place, you'll share the gospel, people just aren't open. Don't shake the dust off your feet, don't curse them, don't do anything stupid. Just realize there's just not a readiness yet. But there is some good news even in their rejection. How many of you want to know what the good news is? Come back tomorrow. First trip to Israel. First trip to Israel, our tour guide. Going to Israel is great because we went to all three places where Jesus was born. It was great. I hope it was one of them. Anyway. It, we were by this field and he says, you know, he says, we plant crops different today than, than in Bible days. In Bible days, what they would do is they would throw a seed out in the field and then they would plow wherever there was seed. Now today we plow and then we plant seed. But in Bible days, where the seed was thrown, a plow would come. The next time you share the gospel with somebody and they say, I don't want to hear it, just smile, because the plow is on the way. <laughs> the seed invites the plow. Just smile, and in your heart say, it's too late. It's too late. Come on. He says, if the household is worthy, greet it. Let your peace rest on the house. If not, if they want nothing to do, then take it back. What is he talking about? He's actually describing what ministry looks like. Now, unfortunately, this verse is very abstract for us because we've not been trained in the abiding presence and how we minister with him, empowered by him, and literally impart him. But if we can shift in these next few years and turn our focus to uh, Benny Hinn's book, uh, Good Morning Holy Spirit, is a real, a real good eye-opener for us on how to, how to shift our attention on the presence who's been given to us. Take that as a model, as a beginning, a jump-off place, and say, you know what? Everything rotates around my relationship with the Holy Spirit. And realize now that as we go places, the Holy Spirit is actually coming upon us in power that we might impart Him. He He's not upon us in power so that we will look good. He doesn't come upon us in power so that our self-esteem will be built up or that we'll somehow discover our identity. 
He comes upon us in power because we've been sent to bring about a military invasion into a realm that has been occupied by the enemy. We are a people that carry presence into the environment. Now I want to share one more verse with you and I want you to go to John chapter 20 and we'll end it with this. John chapter 20. Verse 19. Then the same, same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the disciples, excuse me, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be to you. You know, Jesus walks through the wall and appears. You may need peace. <laughs> when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. Now, what is Jesus doing? Remember, Jesus has already told the disciples in Matthew 10 when you go into a house, let your peace rest on the house. So, what is he doing? He, he's releasing peace. He is, he is honestly announcing what I have trained you for really begins now. They have functioned for three and a half years under the umbrella of his anointing, but he has now trained them to release them on their own. I mentioned this morning that the prayer of John the Baptist that is such a great prayer of humility is not technically a legal prayer for us. The prayer is, God, I must decrease, you must increase. Jesus, I must decrease, you must increase. John the Baptist was closing out the Old Testament era. He was passing on the baton to Jesus, who was initiating the existence of the kingdom on the earth. A new message, a new presence. Jesus called himself the light of the world, but before he left, he called you the light of the world. And in fact, what Jesus did is he passed on the baton to you. It is not time for you to decrease. It's time for you to increase. Now, what we mean when we pray it is we don't want the selfishness, the, you know, the unholiness and all the junk, you know, that just seems to go on in so many people's lives. That's what we want to see it in. But listen, it might be a better prayer to pray. God, you know, people pray this. They say, oh, God, none of me and all of you. I can just see the Father saying, man, I had none of you before I made you, and I, I didn't like it. That's why I made you. I mean, we pray things that we're sincere about, but they have to get interpreted once they get to heaven. It basically comes down to this. If he actually answered what we prayed, he'd have to kill us. He said, I don't want none of you. I want all of you, but I want all of you covered by all of me. It's not time for you to decrease. It's time for you to increase, but increase in the knowledge of the Lord and the realm of his presence being immersed. The scripture says, comprehend this one, that you are to be filled with the fullness of him that fills all in all. The billions of universes that he holds in the palm of his hand, that God wants to fill you with his fullness. If someone that big gets inside of you, you better leak or there's something bound up way too tight. <laughs> so he walks through the wall, he shows up and he says, peace to you. And he showed him his hands and his side. And then verse 21, he says to them again, peace to you. As the Father sent me, I send you. Now, stop right there. As the Father sent me, I send you. Say that with me. As the Father sent me, I send you. Now, for three and a half years, he has taught them. He has modeled life. Everything has built to this one moment. He has now defeated death. He's defeated the grave. He's defeated hell. Everything is now under his feet. He stands there before his disciples. 
He is raised from the dead. He comes into the room. And this is the first now of several commissionings. And the words out of his mouth are this. As the Father sent me, I send you. Now, if Jesus would have stood before his 12 disciples or his 11, and he would have said, he walks into the room and he says, as the Father sent me, I send you. If the very first thing he did following that statement was to preach to crowds, we would say the most important thing for us to do as we have been sent out to do what Jesus did, the most important assignment is to preach to crowds. Why? Because it's the first act that followed this profound statement. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. If he would have turned and healed somebody, we would have come to the conclusion, the first act, while there's many things we're supposed to do with the Christian life, there's nothing more important than the first thing he did right after giving this brand new commission to his disciples. As the Father sent me, I send you. And yet for some reason, Jesus' first act after this statement gets divorced from the statement. Look at what he says. He says, as the Father sent me, I send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I don't know if this makes sense to you or not. It's too easy to look at this as a rare act that was for Jesus to impart the Spirit to the disciples and not become a model where Jesus in one act summarized all of ministry. Whether it's healing the sick, whether it's raising the dead, whether it's preaching to crowds for their conversion, no matter what he did, everything was wrapped up in this one statement that wherever he went, the Spirit of God was released into the atmosphere and it was the Spirit of God that brought about the change. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke. It's not just nice words, even if the nice words are true. It's the fact that the words are spirit, and that spirit releases truth into a situation that reverses its effect. Eternity is imparted into the lives and hearts of people through a decree, through a declaration. Nothing happens in the kingdom until first there's a declaration. And Jesus now takes the 11. He says, I'm boiling it down to this. The Father is sending you to do what he sent me to do. The same commission is on you. And his first act was what? To release the Spirit of God over the eleven. Why? Because everything they were to do from that point on, in fact, involved finding a place for the dove to rest. Everything. Everything is the fact that the Spirit of God in you is looking for, the, looking for the, the tender hearts of people, those who are even calloused and angry on the outside, but he can see past it all, that one touch on that person, they would preserve that touch forever. They would never, they would never be the same again. This Holy Spirit that's been given to you and to me long to find another resting place. And that's your privilege in life is first let the Spirit remain upon you so that you can part, impart that presence everywhere you go. Let's stand and we'll pray. I don't mind if some need to slip out. I, I don't mind that at all. Just if you can do it quietly, it, it would be nice. I tell you what, I feel like there's 
I, I'm not even sure how to pray except that the Lord would open our eyes to what he's given us. You know, there's something again, it's maybe the most frequent prayer I pray when I pray for the church is I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to rest upon God's people. Why? You know, in the natural, you're not going to write the million dollar check if you don't know you have the million dollars in the bank. And in the spirit, you're not going to take extraordinary risk to raise the dead or to stand in our grocery store and get on the microphone and announce to people that God is in the store and he wants to heal people. You're not going to go to Disneyland and watch a revival form in front of you just because you prayed for one young man and it begins to spread like wildfire. You're not going to write those checks if you don't know what you have. It's not going to come through much preaching. It's going to come with divine encounter. I've had encounters with the Lord that are simple and have to be treasured in their simplicity. And I've had him scare me. And everything he does is of value and merit. I used to go into the store, you know, I, I still do, but I, there was a store in our town, I don't live there anymore, so it's a, it's a different story now, but it's a store, it's a health food store, it was a, one of the cultic kind, you know, where they had all the different gurus and all the weird stuff, you know, but I love going to those places, and they think they have light. They, they really do. They think they have light. And if light doesn't walk in the room, they're going to die thinking they're in light. And whereas in the Old Testament, I would need to stay clear of the place because I would be contaminated. In the New Testament, I'm the one who contaminates. <laughs> Contamination contamination isn't the right word because actually a better word would be sanctify, to make clean, to change the environment where people can see who couldn't see before. I would stand on the outside of the door of the store. If I didn't feel ready, I would stand there and pray for a moment and make sure that when I went in, see, whatever you're aware of, you can impart. And I'd stand there until I became aware of the manifestation of his presence upon me physically. When I became aware of him, I would walk in. I didn't walk in acting weird, praying in tongues, laying hands on everything. I went in to buy cheese. <laughs> I would just go up two or three aisles before I got to it because I was like one of them sprinkler heads. <laughs> Those rainbird sprinklers. I'm just watering the entire world. I'd walk up this aisle and down that aisle and eventually get to the cheese. And finally, the owner took me aside one day, and he said, Bill, he says, come here. Something is different when you walk into the store. Now, I'm only saying that to say this, because there was many Christians that went in. But I was learning at that time what it meant to host the presence. What was it like to have the Spirit of God rest upon you and then let Him bring about the change in the atmosphere? I want to pray that. I want to pray that for you. I want to, I want to pray that. I, I realize that talking about something like this probably gives permission for some people just to be weird. It's going to happen. That doesn't make me nervous. I'm more nervous about us not accomplishing our assignment. Excess doesn't bother me near as much as lack. That was really a good point, Bill. <laughs> but it was, it's probably too late in the message to really have effect. So, All right, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. And this, this is what I want to pray. I'm going to pray that the Lord will set you up. I'm going to pray. Now listen carefully. I'm going to pray 
that a specific journey would be started right now tonight. A journey, an engagement with God that begins now. Now, some of you may have a dramatic encounter. Others of you, you're here out of obedience or response. It is all written down. And what is about to happen in people's lives in the next days, weeks, and months, in some ways will be, term, be determined by what we pray right now. Because I believe God is setting people up. How is it? You know, let's face it, Heidi's our favorite. She's God's favorite and she's mine. I'm going to agree with God. You know, I'm not stupid. <laughs> How is it that a missionary can pour a life out for 17 years, birth two churches, three churches, two of which are on life support, and then she gets touched by God, a divine encounter that can't be explained, it can't be controlled, and in the following 10 years, 10,000 churches are planted where the dead are raised, the blind see, the lame walk. How is it? How is it that after an encounter with the Lord that can't be explained, it's not better sermons, it's not more powerful prayers, there was as much earnest prayer before, but how is it that encounter with the Lord where after that one encounter, everything changes. I don't know. I just know I'm in desperate need of ongoing, deeper encounters with the Spirit of God because He changes my capacity to give. Listen, one of the greatest bummers in the world is to be more famous than you are anointed. one of the most horrible experiences as you could ever imagine. There's no thrilling part to having people come to you expecting to get from you what they need from Jesus and have them only get what you have to offer. There's nothing exciting about that. It's one of the most humiliating experiences possible is that people leave with Bill and not God. And for every one of you, I'm telling you, you are signing up for something that can shape the course of world history. But you'll have to make it past the hurdle of being able to deliver what you can give and tap into a realm of the Holy Spirit where only He can change the life of the person you're about to minister to. We are a people in desperate need of ongoing, fresh, fresh anointing, ongoing revelation, ongoing encounters of the Holy Spirit that we cannot control and we cannot explain. It's important that the awe gets restored. The shock and awe needs to be restored to the house.